My name is Josh Shell, host of the Let's Start a Cult podcast, the only podcast host that uses this platform to learn how to become a better grifter. So far, I am not doing very well. <laughs> now, with that out of the way, it's time for me to introduce my guest this week. You may know him as my unofficial co-host because he's been on so many times, but you will now know him as my official co-host on our brand new podcast, Reddit on Wiki, the podcast where we openly admit to using Reddit and Wiki as our main source of information. We talk about anything and everything we find interesting, from the lost colony of Roanoke to Florida Man, we will have you learning and laughing along with us. Please welcome my good friend, John. How are you doing, buddy? What's going on? And what is this? The fifth episode that I've been in already? God damn. Fourth, maybe? M- maybe. Uh, it's true, though. I am a fourth of your content. <laughs> you're getting there. Yeah, you're every every month I have to have you on. It's a contractual obligation, I think. It is. It is. <laughs> Just how it's contractually obligated for you to listen to Drake because you're from Canada. <laughs> exactly. It's the same thing. <laughs> And like me, contractually obligated to eat rice at least once or twice a day. (laughs) (laughs) And for me to hate spicy food. That's (laughs) Oh, gosh. (laughs) So our first episode of Reddit on Wiki is August 2nd. Very exciting. What episode are you most excited for everyone to listen to, John? Well, I mean, we did the little poll and (laughs) apparently the last colony of Roanoke is the most voted on. So I want to go with that one because I think that's the kickoff. It kind of sets the precedence on on what we're going to be talking about, but really it goes off the rails the second episode and then the third episode is completely different. So you kind of get a taste of everyone's different style and and we're just going to mess you up completely. I was going to say, our second episode is going to be on kayfabe and the end definitely, definitely stay tuned to the end. It gets a... (laughs) Wild. We will clip it and and uh, share that all probably everywhere. So so stay tuned for Pretty that. Episode. <laughs> but we are talking about cults today, John. I know I know we've been recording a lot for other podcasts, but we're actually going back to my roots anyway. Because <laughs> in this episode of Let's Start a Cult, we are talking about the story of the Children of Thunder, a trio led by a fanatic who believed that it was his mission to kill the leaders of the Mormon Church. To carry this out, he brainwashed his younger brother and his roommate to carry out a horrific murder spree that left even the presiding judge reeling from its bloodying details. <laughs> I have never heard of them ever before. It is a it is a cool name. The Children of Thunder? Like, I would think they're like yeah. praying to Thor or something like that. But Right. Sadly, they are not. They waste such a cool name on such a terrible act. <laughs> if, I mean, if they weren't, if they weren't, you know, the worst people. I mean, I don't, I don't know them. I guess I, I wouldn't mind being like the fourth official member. Like I'd want a cool nickname, you know, like Lord Thunder Thighs or something. Oh, there you go. <laughs> they, they, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I'm gonna take. I like that. I feel you would take it into a different direction and I don't, I don't know if they would have you along around for very long. <laughs> no, definitely no killing involved. Yeah. Yeah. You'd be like, we could just go chill, you know, play some, some Xbox or something. <laughs> We can each buy Mjolnir, like the hammer, and wield that. <laughs> <laughs> Pretend we're Thor or something. I, I, I think right. I think you would take it in a much lighthearted, much more lighthearted direction. We would definitely get kicked out. Just like, <laughs> hey, you don't belong in this group. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I'm just going to hop into it. We're going to talk about the Helzer brothers. I think that's how it's pronounced. But uh, raised by their devout Mormon parents in a small town near San Francisco, The Helzer brothers, Taylor and Justin, seem like your average run-of-the-mill American kids, as they usually start out as. (laughs) In high school, Justin excelled in wrestling and even joined his school's official team. Unlike other athletes, though, he was shy and introverted, often seeking approval from his older brother, who reportedly encouraged those feelings in him by saying that he was number two to Taylor's number one. (laughs) So... A great older brother, uh, just right. making your younger brother feel like shit so that he looks Inf- like Inferior, pretty much, yeah. yeah. It's like, I'm older, I'm better than you, so yeah. okay. Which, to be fair, as teenagers, that's not uncommon if, if we're going to... It's not. Yeah, it happens. I was definitely a, a, <laughs> a dick to my younger brother. That I think, <laughs> I think everyone is. I don't know. I can't relate. I'm an only child, so... <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> No one's going to steal my thunder. So you're worse than both of them. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, definitely. Later, their cousin Charney Hoffman would testify that, quote, A lot of my understanding of Justin is best described in contrast to Taylor. Moments with Taylor were moments of clarity. 
It was impossible to be around Taylor without being deeply influenced by him. The experience of being in Taylor's presence is so profound. I think it would be difficult for someone with Justin's personality. I don't think he had a chance, end quote. So he says looking back that uh, it was definitely going to happen that Justin would inevitably do something terrible with his brother <laughs> or, or yeah. at least be controlled by his brother. Upon graduating from high school, both Helzer brothers went on a two-year mission trip to fulfill their requirements of the Mormon faith. Taylor decided to have his in Brazil, while Justin opted for nearby Texas. Your home state there, John. <laughs> my, my second home state. Well, it's where you are now. Te- technically, <laughs> both home states. I mean, he's from California, but San oh, Francisco. True. But Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> it's you, yeah, John. It's following me. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> When they returned home to California, both immediately found work. Justin as a cable installer and Taylor as a stockbroker in San Francisco. In 1993, he married his girlfriend Anne and had two daughters with her before separating in June 1996, after feeling suffocated by the constraints of the Mormon church. Which, fair, yeah, they're pretty pretty strict. Two years later, in August 1998, Taylor left his cushy job at Morgan Stanley Dean Witter and went on disability after being diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And this is where things start to go downhill. And I think it goes to prove a lot of cult leaders definitely have some sort of bipolar disorder, if not some sort of disorder anyway. Right. I mean, just for them to kind of flip the switch between kind of what's, I guess, normal and what's ethical to forcing the people that, you know, they can kind of control control their masses by kind of flipping a switch and yeah that sounds like something that's in that spectrum pretty much yeah exactly around this time taylor was excommunicated by the mormon church for his indecent behavior which included smoking drinking and having sex with women other than his wife (laughs) which i mean the last part's fair the other parts is like come on he's just having a little fun yeah for real (laughs) sounds like a saturday night to me yeah (laughs) besides the last part oh my god my wife hopefully she don't kick my ass when she hears me (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'll, I'll cut that part out I, I won't <laughs> do it <laughs> I'm not doing it <laughs> We need clicks Yeah, yeah <laughs> He also began developing his own disturbing belief system And telling family members that good and evil were non-existent And that the scripture was being misinterpreted These pronouncements became even more erratic after he lost his job And before long, Taylor was confiding in his friends That he was a prophet receiving messages directly from God Ah, it's not a cult there it in, is. until the leader either believes or tells people that he is a god or a messenger of God. And oh, uh, God. it's starting pretty early. Yeah, I mean, I, I can see people questioning certain things about scripture or the Bible and all that. I'm, I'm yeah. one of them myself. Like, I don't really necessarily think some of the, the translations translate accurately, especially to like modern understanding. But mm-hmm. for you to kind of embrace the role and say, hey, this is wrong, but I have the right word. I have the right information yeah. and therefore I'm your Messiah. That is exactly when shit goes to <laughs> that shit, when that shit, when the shit hits the fan pretty much. Yeah, no, I agree. Like good and evil definitely are non-existent probably in the world. It's, it's more, there's a lot, there's, it's all gray basically. And then there's people who are better and people who are eviler and you know, it's like a spectrum. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) More evil. So yeah, I I can understand definitely questioning it like you, but yeah, to claim you have the answers is where I disagree. (laughs) On Memorial Day, 1999, the Helzer brothers attended a murder mystery dinner held at their local Mormon temple. That evening, they were reportedly dressed in all black and thus stood out from the rest of the suburban attendees, most of whom wore starched shirts and pressed chinos. It was at that event that Justin met Dawn Goodman, a single mother mother in her mid-twenties who had recently moved into town and was working at a grocery store. Desperate to find a direction in her life, she decided to join the Mormon church, although she was said to be an outcast much like the Helzer brothers. While Dawn began dating Justin shortly after the murder mystery dinner, She was reportedly fascinated by his charismatic older brother. Taylor managed to convince her to join a self-awareness seminar, which consisted of spending a few days inside a windowless room while a facilitator aggressively badgered them to confront their inner demons. (laughs) Which sounds like most university classes I attended, if we're (laughs) we're being honest. (laughs) So, not that crazy, but no. uh, Absolutely ridiculous. Um... After completing two of the seminar's three levels, Don began receiving spiritual guidance from Taylor. 
He had become completely unhinged by this point, telling her that sometime in January 2000, it was his destiny to take over the Mormon church by all means necessary. He also began calling himself Don and his brother the Children of Thunder, claiming that it was their mission to create a state of peace and joy for everyone. Hey. <laughs> if that's not unhinged, I don't know what is. <laughs> that, that is wild. Yeah. Just being like, I'm taking over the Mormon church and no one can stop me. <laughs> and I got my children of thunder with me. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That, does, that's, that does sound pretty intimidating now you think about it. It's a pretty cool name. I'm I'm 100% sold on the name. I love the name. I do, too. Yeah. Which is my problem with most of these cults. They take these cool names and just fucking ruin them <laughs> for everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> Taylor informed Dawn that it was her duty to create a self-help group called Impact America as this would help them successfully defeat Satan. They came up with several plans to finance this venture, including creating a subsidiary named Intimacy, which would provide wealthy businessmen with prostitutes. So, basically a pimping service. (laughs) Okay. This Um, is an interesting business model. Yeah, no, it gets way worse. Like, okay, so it goes off the rail with this next plan. After another financial scheme involved adopting orphans from Brazil and taking them to the United States where they would be trained to assassinate the 15 leaders of the Mormon church. Yeah. (laughs) I know it's an audio podcast, so you can't see John's reaction, but (laughs) dumbfounded would be a great... (laughs) Well, I like where you went there. You know, I'm starting to make... It's it's starting to sound like a a certain plot of a video game series called Assassin's Creed. (laughs) It's literally that. (laughs) You have your Knights Templar... (laughs) Going against the Mormons? Yeah. Or the the, the Brotherhood Assassin? Uh, what is it? The Brotherhood of Assassins yeah. going against the, the Mormon church? With Yeah, with an underlying <laughs> religious tone to it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's 100% the, the, the Assassin's Creed. I wouldn't be surprised if they come out with this next year. <laughs> oh, my God. I mean, yeah, they come out with like, every, yeah, instead of like, you go from freaking, uh, <laughs> you go from like the Nords and then next thing you know, Mormons. Yeah, <laughs> some American uh, just adopting Brazilian children and training them. <laughs> Your, you play as one of the Brazilian children. <laughs> oh, shit. Uh, yeah, so these, I mean, these plans were clearly impractical, so they, they never actually did them. Thankfully, <laughs> and uh, the, the Helzer brothers, along with Don, finally settled on extorting money from one of Taylor's former clients, a wealthy senior citizen who could be easily killed in case the situation called for it. So, you know, not better, but it, less crazy anyway <laughs> of a plan. It's more like more people think of extortion rather than adopting children. <laughs> right. And, and to me, a lot of these things, like I question a lot of some of the motives, especially when they say like, oh, I'm here to defeat Satan. Yeah. How exactly are you going to do that? Are you going to pull up in hell and just be like, hey, yo, Satan, what's up? 1v1 me right now, bro. Like, <laughs> let's square up. Like, yeah. put on some gloves. <laughs> what are you? I don't know. Like, how are you going to defeat Satan? Yeah. That's kind of what I'm always wondering about when it comes to, I don't know, zealot's not the word for it, but it's like these crazed people thinking that, you know, they could change something using religion as a motive. Yeah. There's been thousands and thousands of generations of humans. You think you're the one that's going to 1v1 Satan right. if he's real? <laughs> <laughs> Just square up, bro. Yeah. Like, what's up? We got a trio. We are the children of thunder, which, fair. That like Maybe it's three people. Maybe it takes three people to take them on. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, 3v1. That's all good. Yeah. 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 So, so, yeah. So, they're going in for extortion. They had other affluent marks in mind, all of whom had, at some point, been handled by Taylor back when he was working as a stockbroker. However, the scheme called for another individual to open a bank account and launder the extorted money for them. The trio knew that they would have to kill this individual too, and so they settled on a 22-year-old Selena Bishop, whom Taylor had met at a rave party in spring of 2000. Selena had uh, had been working as a waitress at a local hangout called Two Bird Cafe when she met Taylor. She fell head over heels from him instantly, obsessed with his good looks and shoulder-length hair, which he wore in a ponytail. I've seen pictures of this dude. I don't know if it's just me. I don't find him that like oh, that it's that cap attractive. pretty much. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> like like he's he's super average looking dude. I don't know. I, maybe that um, was that was a qu- that was another question I've had too. Is like, is it a prerequisite to be good looking to be a cult leader? Because I'm out in the running for that one. I don't. I don't know. Maybe uh, maybe it's just me. And I, I whenever I look at the cult leaders, I think, oh, you guys have done terrible things. So that maybe. 
affects how I'm looking at them, but I don't find many of them that attractive. But I I know it, it is a like a it's a weird kink. There are women who will write into these people on death row oh, and absolutely. like all yeah. that kind of stuff. So I don't know. Maybe it's just the the danger or the confidence they exert that is more of the attraction. I I, I couldn't tell you, but yeah, definitely she fell for him. So that was not not a good thing for her, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. It's probably the charm. Like maybe he has a business card saying, you know, what's his name again? Uh, Taylor. Taylor. Yeah. And then in the bottom, his title is freaking <laughs> Son of Thunder. <laughs> well, so, or, <laughs> so you, you, so that's actually funny. Child of goes, Thunder, I'm sorry. <laughs> it goes into uh, the next point. She had no idea that everything he told her about him was a lie. So for one thing, he introduced himself as Jordan. So completely different name. And for another, he refused to give her his phone number and also declined to attempt uh, to take photos of him. So she was like, oh, let's take pictures together. And he was like, nope, also no phone number. (laughs) And Taylor, or Jordan, as Selena called him, was hesitant about getting to know any of her family and friends. According to her Aunt Olga, she said, quote, he didn't want to meet any of us. From the people I talked to who he did meet, he gave them the creeps, end quote. Not a good sign. Aunt, Aunt Olga knows. She she knows <laughs> from the old country. Hey, he's, he's doing the, the classic side chick treatment, you know? It's like, hey, we can't be seen in public. Yeah. <laughs> well, I wonder if it's like, I know there was a, there's, I mean, probably in his mind, he's like, he's a psychopath. So he's like, I just, I don't want people knowing who I am so I don't get caught. But another part of me is maybe wondering if the human part of him was like, I don't want to get to know her family because I know I have to kill her. Like... I wonder right. if that was part of it. I, that's the hopeful part of me. The the uh, realist of me is like, no, he's just a fucking dick and didn't want to meet anyone. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, that kind of that kind of goes to your point that some of these people might have some sort of bipolar syndrome. Because I know it seems like a trend to a lot of either murderers or, or, or people who, who does things like that. Mm-hmm. They want to be known because they're pretty narcissistic. Yeah. So may, maybe the other side of them is like, you know, okay, I don't want to get caught. So yeah, uh, I, I, yeah, like let's not <laughs> let's not expose <laughs> myself even more. So that yeah. could pro- that that probably plays in a little more to that that theory that we have. Yeah, exactly. In July 2000, Selena agreed to open four bank accounts under her name, believing that she was helping her boyfriend hide inheritance money from his vindictive ex-wife. She also began pursuing him to finalize his divorce, not knowing that she was a mere pawn in his vicious game. To quote journalist Julius Shears of Turner Entertainment, quote, Taylor had no feelings for her. <laughs> he had money to steal and people to kill. The reciprocating saw he used to cut up his girlfriend's body had already been purchased at the local Sears. The duffel bags that would hold her remain at the local Kmart, end quote. So while he is dating her and she's opening these accounts for him, he's already got the tools that he's going to use to kill her and My hide goodness. her body. Like, what a fucking asshole. What the fuck? Dude, how can you premeditate that? You know what I mean? It's just it's yeah. just so much things going on and, and you're 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 kind of manipulating someone to do all these crazy steps for you. Yeah. And the end game is still gonna be the same. Like, yeah, you're just a tool, you're just a pawn. Yeah. That's it, insane. So fucked up. Besides Selena Bishop, the trio also planned to kill 78-year-old Anita Steinman and her husband, 85-year-old Ivan both of whom had worked with Taylor back when he was a stockbroker in San Francisco. The couple had developed a friendship with him over the years, one that had lasted until well after he left Morgan Stanley. He would often drop by their house and even went so far as to take them river rafting one summer, accompanied by their daughter Nancy Hall. Later, Nancy would testify that her father saw Taylor as his own son. The Steinmans weren't the trio's original targets, though. Rather, Taylor had planned to extort and murder another one of his former clients, a wealthy man who lived in the nearby town of Walnut Creek. However, he wasn't home when the Helzer brothers paid him a visit, and so they moved on to the next people on their list, Anita and Ivan. Now, I think it's a great time to insert here. Uh, You know who won't plan to extort and murder you? The wonderful companies that support this podcast. Unless... Unless it's Amazon, they they will absolutely do that. But I'm more than happy to take their money. So, so here are some ads. <laughs> Jeffrey Bezos. <laughs> Today's episode is brought to you by Omeo. 
Omeo is a travel booking platform that makes planning a journey in Europe and North America effortless. Just enter your travel details and Omeo will magically give you all the train, bus, flight, and ferry options for your journey. It's never been simpler to book your first real vacation for 2021. Best of all, using Omeo saves you time and money. That's a win-win in our books. Omeo wants to help you leave your house this summer by offering 5% off your next booking. Just head to omeo.com and use the code LISTENER5 at checkout. Valid until the 30th of June for new users on all modes of transportation. It's just the pick-me-up 2021 needs. Omeo. Plan, book, and love the journey. Terms and conditions apply. All right, let's hop back into it. On July 30th, 2000, the Helzer brothers, decked out in black suits and carrying briefcases, arrived at the Steinmans' home, which was located only a few miles away from the Concord house that they were renting. They immobilized the elderly couple using shackles purchased from a bookstore earlier that day and forced them inside a white pickup truck, which had Don Goodman at the wheel. Together, the Children of Thunder drove the Steinmans to their rental home, where they made Anita call the local branch of Morgan Stanley in order to liquidate her investments. It was believed that she and her husband had been made to drink a date rape drug called Rufinol, so roofies, uh, roofies to make them yeah. more complacent as they wrote out two checks, one for $33,000 and another for $67,000. Both of these were addressed to Selena Bishop. It's just, it's just unfortunate, you know, it's... A lot of older couples, especially, you live that long. You mm-hmm. would think you would just get your due time and, you know, the natural causes. But for you to get yeah. duped like that by by a couple of assholes, uh, that's just, that's life's cruelness. Oh, it's not even duped. Them, you know what I mean? Like, I, I guess in a way, because they trusted him. But I wouldn't say they were duped necessarily the same way, like, Sophia was. They were duped as, like, they trusted him as, like, a friend. And then he yeah. kind of forced them, he for, like, he forcefully took their money from them, so... Taylor initially believed that the couple would overdose on the roofies and die, but while they did slip into a coma, they still kept on breathing, which spurred the Helzer brothers to take drastic measures in a bid to hide their crime. Ivan Steinman's, oh, well, I, I should trigger warning for anyone who uh, does not want to hear this, but because it, it gets a little, a little brutal. Ivan Steinman's head was slammed against the tile floor while Anita's throat was brutally slit with a hunting knife. Later, Don, who witnessed the murders, testified in court saying that, quote, I couldn't really believe what, that this was happening. The only thing I could do was pray that the couple would die so that it would just be done with. End quote. The following day, Taylor ordered his younger brother to dismember the couple's bodies with the power saw. He reportedly declined to do the dirty work himself, claiming that he had to sit and meditate to receive messages from the spirit. So, so Taylor's like, you have to do it because I have to go, you know, listen to God or whatever. Right. <laughs> so, After they just did some crazy shit. Like, yeah. come on now. But it, I, I find some humor in that part because, like, as an older brother, it's like, I don't want to do the dirty work. You do it. <laughs> like, yeah, you do it. Like, as shitty as the thing he's doing is, it's uh, there's a little bit of, uh, you can see, like, an older brother doing something like that <laughs> just, just to be an extra shitty person. Right. Once Justin was done hacking away at the couple's corpses, the Children of Thunder knelt beside the body parts and thanked them for sacrificing their lives for a greater cause. Definitely not a greater cause. Then they attempted to feed the remains to several dogs that they had adopted from a local pound, especially for that purpose. However, this plan failed. Instead, they were forced to stuff the body parts into gym bags, which they weighed down with rocks before dumping them into the Mokalum, Mokalumman River? Probably butchered that, but uh, yeah, so they threw them in oh, a that's river. Not, that's, that's not the right word to say, it, butchering a word after. <laughs> oh, <Okay>. God. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> Yeah, we went there. He's back with the puns. <laughs> <laughs> and also canceled yourself. So. <laughs> Damn it. Uh, <laughs> August 1st, Selena Bishop walked into a local bank and deposited the checks into her bank account, claiming that she had received hundreds of thousands of dollars from her grandparents to pay for her open heart surgery. The following day, she went out on a date with her boyfriend and was said to have had expressed frustration when he failed to show up on time. According to a news report, Quote, Bishop was in a especially good mood that night. The next day, she and her boyfriend were planning to drive to Yosemite National Park for a camping trip. No doubt she hoped it would be an opportunity for them to get closer and for her f- boyfriend to finally divulge more information about himself. End quote. That's on August 2nd, which actually is our podcast release date. Keep that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> Always be plugging. That's, that's the motto. 
On August 3rd, a neighbor testified that she saw an 1984 Honda Accord drive up to the house that the Children of Thunder were renting. Inside was Selena, who was planning to spend the day driving with Taylor to Yosemite. Unfortunately for her, the romantic massage he had promised turned out to be a ploy for her to lie down in an incredibly vulnerable position. In a retelling of events, a news reporter claimed that, quote, as she lay face down on the carpet, contentedly yielding herself to her boyfriend's strong hands as he rubbed her back, Justin Helzer walked into the room with a hammer. Perhaps Taylor was crooning sweet nothings into her ear. She was young, in love, and about to go on a romantic vacation with her boyfriend. She was happy. She never imagined what Taylor was capable of. Whatever was going on, whatever she was thinking as she laid on that carpet, she didn't know what hit her, as Justin slammed the hammer into her head several times, cracking her skull. End quote. Miraculously, Selena was still alive after this. It wouldn't, wouldn't be for long, though. Taylor carried her to the bathroom where he told her that, quote, Spirit says you get to know this isn't a dream, end quote, before slashing her throat with the same hunting knife that he'd used on Anita Steinman. That is dark. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so, I don't know, there's, there's almost nothing good to gain from this story. <laughs> like, I'm glad she, like, in her last few moments was, like, in a happy place. You know what I mean? Like, in her mind, she was like, I'm going on a vacation. Like, this is good. But it's terrible. To, like, like she seemed like such a good person and just, like, willing right. to help out and, like, wanting to, like, help her boyfriend with this, with the money stuff and, and not yeah. knowing where it was coming from, but assuming it was to hide it from his ex and, and, and then go on a nice vacation and hopefully get to know her boyfriend. And then it ends in, right. ends in her life, basically, which is just fucking terrible and, and goes to show you just... What a piece of shit this guy is. He's one of the exactly. worst cult, exactly. like, cult leaders I talk about. And I'm going to say, like, and this is not, like, victim blaming at all, but, you know, it's it's just it's just hard to kind of explain the reasoning why someone would be that trusting initially, especially mm -hmm. if they don't want to divulge, like, complete information about them themselves yep. for them to help them out. But again, this I'm not trying to victim blame them because I'm I'm actually watching this this show now. It's been out for a while. I think it's called it's called Dirty John. I don't know if you've ever is it about ever you? seen it. <laughs> no, <laughs> my wife tells me it's about me. But yeah, it's pretty much the same. Like the it's, I'm I'm only in like the fifth episode of the first season, but it's pretty much about the same. This person kind of lied about his personality, lied about his what he's about. And he pretty much tricked the, the, the girl to give him all her assets or like share all the assets with him. Right. And, and this is, it all comes to how terrible some people can get, you know, and it's just taking advantage of someone's kindness, someone's, I, I guess, heart to help you out on, yeah. on your time of need. And you're just going to take advantage of that. Some people are just. Yeah. Fucked up, man. No, I, I get what you're saying. Like, it, it's, it, it sucks because it's, we shouldn't be in a position where we have to say, don't trust people as much as... Because, like, if it was a world full of Selena's and, and no Taylor's, like, the world would be such a great Way place. Way better. Exactly. But it sucks that it's like, there are Taylor's out there, so you have to keep the people like Selena on their toes and, like, prepare right. to just question things because... There are terrible, terrible people out there, and it's fucked up what the stuff they'll do to manipulate people who just trust and, and they're like good-hearted people who could never yep. even fathom someone doing something so horrible. And I think it's also a lot of reasons why people are so jaded nowadays. Like mm -hmm. It's so hard to be more open and be more transparent with people or be more vulnerable because there's a history of people like Taylor that would do fucked up shit like this. And it sucks because we won't be able to advance society as a whole because we're so distrusting mm -hmm. of people like this you know it's, it's just unfortunate and i do feel bad for selena and and you're right like a solace like she is she kind of went out like in a dreamlike scenario but yeah she doesn't deserve any of that stuff you know no no she she 100 percent deserved the best life and like to have someone Absolutely. who respected her and deserved her honesty and and, and right you know, that, that kind of a girlfriend. It's just, it, it's terrible that she happened to stumble upon this piece of shit. And yeah. Uh, Fuck you, Taylor. Yeah. <laughs> he is, he is still alive, but we will get to that. God, please don't sue me though. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't think he'll be able to. The Children of Thunder's murder spree was far from over though. Their next mark was Selena's mother, 45-year-old Jennifer Vill, uh, Villarin, who knew about the bank accounts that her daughter had opened on behalf of her boyfriend. 
In the wee hours of August 4th, Taylor drove to Selena's studio apartment where her mother was staying with a 54-year-old man named James Gamble. The two were mercilessly shot at point-blank range with a Beretta 9mm, which prompted an upstairs neighbor to call 911. So part of me is like, all right, like you've slit two people's throats already. Why did you use a gun in a very heavily populated area? Like, right. my mind went to, you planned all this shit out and then you just kind of fucked up by not being quiet or I, I don't like... I, uh, that's fucked up to think about, but <laughs> but that's all I do is study fucked up people. So what am, what else? Do am you I supposed think? To do? do you think? Do you think maybe they did that because they didn't? Because you know how a lot of times when they do murder investigations, they look for a motive and they look for some sort of notice of mm. how they do their killings. Maybe they wanted to kind of spread it because they're probably not gonna, they're probably not going to find this chick Selena like right away, and they might right. not be able to tie the same type of murder because it's like okay. Selena was like brutally killed. Mm-hmm. It must be something. But then the, the mom was just an execution style kind of stuff. Like maybe they can't correlate the two together. I don't yeah. know. Maybe that's. I, I would have a hard time believing that because like they were dating. Right. And like there were right. people who knew they were dating. And then mm-hmm. on top of that, the two people the the elderly couple he killed were directly like they knew him directly. So I think it, it would have been pretty quickly that they would be able to be like oh like it's definitely this dude with the weird cult killing people yeah. he knows directly so i don't i think they started off with a good plan you know and then analyzing it is is kind of pointless because it's like it's disgusting to yeah. like no matter what no matter how we put it it's yeah. gross they they had a terrible plan they de- they shouldn't have killed anyone and they should have just you know gone to the woods like every other fucking cult and you know been terrible to themselves instead of outwardly terrible. <laughs> I, I'm exactly. O- I'm more okay with that. I feel I still feel bad for the followers, but at least they're doing harm within and not to the world as a whole, which I think is slightly better. Um, Facts. By the time emergency services arrived, though, Taylor had already escaped. On August 4th, 2000, Nancy Hall, the Steinman's daughter, reported her parents missing after they failed to pick up any frantic phone calls. That same day, Kay Shaman, who lived next door to the Helzer brothers, claimed to have seen her neighbors driving a truck to which a trailer with a jet ski was attached. She also testified that there were duffel bags on the truck bed as well as one on the lap of the man in the passenger seat. Now, in my mind, I'm like, I don't know why that raises red flags because, like, if you saw a jet ski and then a bunch of, like, duffel bags, I wouldn't be immediately like, there's bo- there's bodies in that bag. <laughs> like, right. Something's off there. He's just, going to the lake. <laughs> yeah, I would just assume, like, oh, there's probably wetsuits or something. Like, I have no idea. <laughs> a few days later, on August 6th, a Chevrolet Lumina minivan owned by the Steinmans was found by the police in a nearby industrial neighborhood. In addition to a chainsaw and sawhorse, they were able to lift several fingerprints that were founded to be... Justin Helzer's, and Don Goodman's. Based on court testimony that same day, the children of Thunder hired a professional carpentry cleaner to scrub their living room, claiming that the red, large red blotch on their carpet was Kool-Aid. So a link back to my very first episode. According to Hazim Bilal, who was made to clean the stain, Justin and Don had been sitting calmly in the kitchen, eating a snack while watching him work. So very, very creepy. Um, yeah, I I would hate to watch getting watched while I was doing some work. Yeah. Oh, like, yeah, <laughs> my dad does con- construction and it's his biggest pet peeve is when they just watch stand at the bottom of the ladder or something and just stare at you. It's like something could fall like <laughs> like easily fall on you. Please back up. <laughs> and well, um, I hope it does that sometimes. <laughs> well, that's true. But then you're liable. So <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, on the morning of August 7th, police officers raided the home that the Children of Thunder had been renting in search of the gun that had been used to kill Jennifer Valerian and James Gamble. Instead, they found ton of, a ton of ecstasy, hallucinogenic mushrooms, and other similar paraphernalia, which were enough to have the trio arrested on drug possession charges. Taylor attempted to escape twice, but was quickly tracked down by authorities. As the day progressed, more and more evidence was found that linked the trio to the murders of the Steinmans. The duffel bag containing the couple's remains were also unearthed from the Moluccan Makalum river, which exacerbated the police belief that the children of thunder were behind their horrific killings. In December 2001, all three members of the children of thunder were charged with 18 different felonies, which included murder, extortion, and kidnapping. I am very happy that they were 
convicted because that does not often happen with with um, murders, let cults. alone cults. Yeah. <laughs> cults almost <clears throat> never, they almost never get charged. They find, either kill themselves before or, yeah, face no criminal charges often, or not enough. Faced with mounting evidence against them and the possibility of a death penalty, Don Goodman struck a deal with the prosecutors, becoming their star witness and giving up the Helzer brothers in exchange for a lighter punishment. After agreeing to testify against Justin and Taylor, she was sentenced to 38 years to life in prison. So that's the lighter sentence, which, good, fuck her. She was a piece of shit. Right. According to several news outlets, Don's testimony against the Helzer brothers was so sickening that the judge at one point asked for a, quote, collective deep breath. End quote. Before, before continuing. Yeah, so... Definitely. I don't blame him. Yeah, oh, 100%. Like, if she was going into detail about all that stuff I talked about, I would also need a collective deep breath. <laughs> right. In March 2004, shortly before his trial was about to begin, Taylor Helzer entered a surprise guilty plea, with his defense attorney reading aloud an impromptu confession to a stunned courtroom. Justin Helzer, on the other hand, pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity to the 11 charges that a jury had convicted him of. During his Cop trial, out. he was portrayed by both his lawyer and his family members as a mentally ill and vulnerable man coerced into the murders by his more gregarious older brother. Which, in some ways, is fair, but you can only take that so far, in my opinion. Like, right. You can be manipulated, but your actions are your actions, and you can 100% say no at any point in that so especially the severity of the crimes that you committed exactly Ugh, you can't it's just that's just, yeah it's just a cop-out excuse yeah I hate it, that. it's one thing if you're in a store and your brother's like oh i bet you won't steal that lollipop or something like <laughs> like that's right. one thing it's like yeah. all right like yeah you're probably co coerced into it and uh it's a shitty thing but it's not the worst thing in the world but if uh, my brother was like hey go come murder these people with me i'd be like what the fuck? I'm calling the police. Like, you're, you're absolutely going to jail. Right. Um, a psychiatrist who had interviewed him even tested that Justin had a delusional disorder, which led him to believe that Taylor was uh, genuinely a prophet of God, and thus the killings they committed were morally wrong. Yeah. Shortly before sentencing, Justin reportedly told the court that, quote, I want this life to be over. I want to die. I'm being truthful. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to be rude. I just want to be free. I want freedom or death, end quote. And the court obliged. With these resigned words, he was sentenced to the death penalty on August 4th, 2004, four years to the day that the last victim in the murder spree was killed. It was noted that as the verdict was read aloud, both jurors and his loved ones cried openly while the family members of his victims celebrated. All in all, Justin Helzer received three death sentences for the role that he played in the five murders. On April 14, 2013, 41-year-old Justin Helzer was found dead in his cell at San Quentin pr uh, Prison after tying his bedsheet to the cell bars to form a makeshift noose. This had been his second suicide attempt, with the first one leaving him blind after he stabbed his eyes with pens and pencils. In a statement released to the press, Contra Costa County... Chief, Assistant Directive Attorney. Oh my God. Uh, Contra Costa County Chief. <laughs> That's the tongue twister right there. <laughs> and then Assistant Directive Attorney. It's like, you can, Jesus. Sh you can shorten the name a little. <laughs> like, come on, guys. Quadruple C, ADA. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> uh, Harold Jute said, quote, In no sense of the word was Justin Helzer a victim. Nonetheless, the origin of the obvious torment he experienced in prison reflected in self mutilation and now suicide clearly rests at the doorstep of his older brother, Taylor, end quote. So he's basically saying everything that happened to Justin rests on, shoulder, on the shoulders of his older brother, which is fair, because if he didn't have that influence, none of this would have ever happened. Right. Taylor Helzer remains on death row at California San Quentin State Prison. No further updates have been made since his sentencing. It isn't known either if he continues to believe that he, as a prophet of God, has been entrusted with killing the leadership of the Mormon church. One thing is for certain, though. His staunch belief in these led to the horrifying deaths of five people and may have cost his younger brother's life as well. And that is the story of the Children of Thunder, a cult that took an amazing name and ruined it forever. That is so dark. Yeah, definitely one of the darker ones I've covered. Yeah, I don't know what to say. Like, I, I'm glad that they were punished and he is still being punished. I right. have some sympathy towards his brother with just the understanding that I know what manipulation can do to a person. And mm -hmm. 
He was definitely manipulated, but that's still no excuse for what he did. Dawn, on the other hand, 38 years. So this was 2001. So she's, uh, you know, she's still got a couple more years left. <laughs> quite a quite a few. Um, well, hope it had dawn, dawned on her that her, her <laughs> life is fucked. <laughs> I think that's all we need to say on that topic. <laughs> <laughs> It's not even that. It's like they fucked five people's lives up that don't deserve it. Well, more than that, if you think about it, like their families, their friends. Like yeah. It, it, murdering one person affects it's not, hundreds. Yeah, it affects everybody. Exactly. Yeah. It's terrible. Like, And I don't know where they were going. for. They should have just gone with the Brazilian kids plan, I think, in the end. <laughs> like, you know, like, create, create an army of Brazilian assassins. Uh, assassins. Yeah. To kill the Mormon church leaders. Right. <laughs> Take the kids, I mean, this is fucked up. Don't listen to me, guys. <laughs> Take like, uh, uh, you know, if, if they were going to adopt those Brazilian kids out of, you know, life of poverty, at least give them some sort of purpose in life just yeah. to be these badass assassins. But again, don't listen to me. I, it, that was a joke. <laughs> yeah. In, in, if, I'm, if I'm thinking about it, I don't know if they would have treated them much better than they would be in poverty No, absolutely in not. <laughs> but at least they would have the chance to like hopefully get to america and then maybe find a better way of living like they could assassinate their masters and bam exactly which which is another hole actually now that i think about it, it is none of them were assassins how are they going to train these kids to be assassins <laughs> exactly <laughs> exactly send them to jujitsu school for a couple of years i don't know <laughs> oh my gosh uh, anyway john you know what it's time for we've talked about these shitty people for about an hour now and it's time to rate their cult because society doesn't know how to quantify things unless you rate it with a point system <laughs> so out of five stars how would you rate the children of thunder and this is not because i'm i think they're cool okay but i okay. will give them a three three out of five stars okay for for the fo for the following reasons one I, the, the one star is a given right because they're shitty yeah yeah, yeah. but give them a two star because they they do have a cool ass name i'm not gonna okay. lie that shit's cool okay. as fuck and the third part, it seems like they're, I know all their plan kind of came to shit at the very end because of, it seems like the, this organization of their organization kind of led to their end. Yeah. But I did think that they were more a high level in terms of, of a plot as compared to the others, other cults that you've talked about in the past. It's more, right. I guess like high level thinking. It's like, okay, if we extort money, we do this. Even though like the initial plants are kind of idiotic, but <laughs> in the grand scheme of things, had it worked out, that was a pretty good plan if, if had it worked out. Yeah. No, I think that's a fair rating. I wasn't even going to go that high. So <laughs> kudos for you to go and. And it's, it's not, I'm not idolizing them. I just want to no. point that out there. You I love just them. think it's because they're I cool. I understand. <laughs> I just wanted to be, you know, I'm not saying I want to be a part of them, but if I was, I really wanted to be called. Lord Thunder dies with so a bunch of that was children, weird. Brazilian assassins. That's what you assassins. Would, yeah. And I you would, would have train voted, them. You would have voted that plan. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think I have to go with, I wanted to go with one, but I think you've bumped me up to a 1.5 star. I think the name itself gives it, that's, that's its only redeeming quality is the name of the yep. cult. And then the half star is their thought process was, yeah, as you said, slightly ahead of other cults I've talked about. They plan a little bit further ahead, even though it did not work out. Uh, I don't know. For me, it's less of a cult because it's three people. You know what I mean? Like, I feel a cult needs at least five to be cool. Right. Cool, quote unquote. <laughs> and, and yeah, I don't know. It just didn't have, like, it didn't seem like they stuck to their original belief as much as... I think they should have, or well, not should have, but like as much as most cults do, you know, at least if your if your sole job is to kill the Mormon leader group, why are you killing all these other random people? Question, question for you, though. Would you think that this is kind of like their initial plan for a takeover? Because you, like you said, it's not really a, a, a cult per se, unless there's more members, maybe yeah. for them getting the capital for it instead of the traditional sense of a cult where like, hey, I'm going to indoctrinate as much people as possible and then take their money. Right. You, you think they did this because they wanted to speed up that process? Because once they have their capital off the bat, then they can proceed to whatever they want to do much in a, in a much faster rate than building it from the ground up as other cults would do it. I can kind of see that. In some ways, that, that's a potential. In other ways, I'm, I'm looking at it and I'm like, they 
only got a hundred thousand. You know what I mean? I mean that is a lot of money. Right. But if all three especially of them, especially like the the two thousands. Uh, true. Yeah. But or if the all, late nineties. Yeah. If all three of them had worked a year, like this year of planning and killing, or well, not it wasn't a full year, but you know what I mean. They would have easily made that, and then just you know they they could have started funding it more moral ways or. Or yeah, like requesting donations like most cults do, or I don't know. I think I think they, as I said, they they planned what they were going to do. They didn't. I don't think they planned further than that. <laughs> I think they were like, okay, we got to get money to somehow kill the Mormon leaders. I don't know what we do after that. <laughs> like uh, I, I I don't know if they thought about what they would do after they got the money. Right. Or if they were just gonna bail after that. They maybe they were just robbers with some sort of false religious scheme i don't know i don't know or maybe maybe they they, they kind of put that idea to the head so maybe if they do get caught they can use like hey mm. i'm gonna use a plea for insanity as a a way to justify all the crazy and like yeah. inhumane shit that i just did i don't know and only get 38 years to life instead of exactly 42 to life <laughs> either way they're all assholes yeah. all three of them oh yeah 100 percent. i hope he rots in hell or uh, well in prison oh, yeah. for the rest of his life, and then hell, if they yeah, exists. and then they can one v one Satan and then Satan <laughs> yeah. can whoop their ass. Yeah, we'll much. see how he does with Satan when uh, he goes down to meet his brother in dawn. Um, exactly. I don't know if you watch South Park, but this is exactly how he imagines Satan, like how he looks. Okay, perfect. That that <laughs> yeah, it's a big ass dude. That is a big ass dude. I don't think I don't think Taylor's that tall, but he is good looking. Apparently, so apparently <laughs> he's got apparently. that going. He's a charmer. For him. Thank you, everyone, for listening to today's episode of The Children of Thunder. John, let's tell my amazing listeners about our new podcast and where they can listen to it. Oh, my gosh, you put me on a spot. But yeah. like Josh said, we are going to be launching Reddit on Wiki on August 2nd, 2021. I don't know when this episode is going to come out, but be excited. Launch day, we're launching three episodes off the bat. Josh is going to be covering The Lost Colony of Roanoke. Our boy Sean is going to be covering Kayfabe, and I will be... Uh, terribly putting Florida man into some sort of different perspective. And then from there, we'll go on a, on a weekly basis once again, but you can find us wherever you find your podcast. We're on Apple podcasts, Spotify, and anything else you can think of. We're on social media on Instagram and Twitter at Reddit on wiki. That's R E D D I T O N W I K I. And like what Josh said, yes, we admittedly use <laughs> Wikipedia and Reddit as sources we are, I, I diligently study for this podcast. I do not diligently study for <laughs> the other one. No, that one is for fun. We yeah. just have as much fun as possible. And you're in for a surprise. We are going to be reading some erotic fan fiction and it gets really weird. Weird and hot. That's what. <laughs> hot. My hot is because we were sweating the whole yeah, time we were recording. Just <laughs> not we're, we're on the same room together. All right. Just <laughs> we're out there. But. Yeah. It was uh, it was a surprise for sure, but a good one. And uh, I hope you <laughs> I hope you guys enjoy all the episodes. And yeah, definitely subscribe to Reddit on Wiki. We're super super excited to bring that to you guys. And it's a weekly podcast, so it doesn't have to interfere with this one. You guys can subscribe to both, listen to both if you want. And uh, if you're loving this podcast, be sure to give us a review and tell your friends about it. Be sure to go to our Buy Me a Coffee page and become a member for ad free episodes. If you want to keep up to date with the podcast, you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at let's underscore cult. You can follow our Facebook page at facebook.com slash let's start a cult pod, or you can go to let's start a cult podcast.com and sign up for our newsletter. Thank you, Fred, for listening. And thank you, John, for coming on today. We will see you next time, or we will see you next week when Reddit on Wiki releases. So get excited for that. All right. Yeah. <laughs>